Hello, we are here with Merging Minds, and our guest today is Adrian Schreier. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Adrian. Adrian is a very experienced leader and interdisciplinary scientist with a broad background and deep interest in developing technology that can improve people's lives. He's a generalist who thinks deeply about problems and then creates elegant solutions for them, from creating software to building high-performing teams and organizations. Adrian is the CTO as Anagenix, and um, he's leading AI-driven drug discovery. And Adrian, thank you so much for being here with us. It's really a pleasure and an honor, and would like, love to start by giving you the stage and telling us a little bit more about yourself, your past, your current, future, whatever you'd like to go into. Sure, again, uh, Gabriel, thanks for inviting me. Glad to be here, so maybe just start quick background about myself, how did I, end up in that position just uh, described us all a bit of a patchwork background originally started really in the the military so nothing to do with science or technology really always interested me but back then was very much i guess like many people when they leave high school not quite clear yet what's their calling what are supposed to do i basically ended up in the army for two years decided oh, it's not really what i want i want something else something more intellectually challenging demanding where i can really go decide of i really liked science biology chemistry and, and these kind of topics and in high school why not go back uni and basically just focus on on that basically find an honest profession just to make money but in that so i will come back probably to that uh later during the conversation I always had a weakness for art philosophy history so that never went uh, away but obviously that's not usually an area where you can make a great career a stable future so then when i was younger that was more the focus i decided let's focus on science get a real degree that's what i did I studied biology uh, as, an, as undergrad a lot of lab, lab work work went to uh, london went to travel quite a lot and then basically from there on progressed more on the, into the computational side, the master's in computer science, and then PhD postdoc in Cambridge was quite the, the experience from then just all happened by organically. Then my first big job out of the postdoc was the startup at the time called Accenture, so one of the pioneers in AI during drug design. That's where I spent more than 10 years of my life. It was a great time. I learned a lot about basically AI so basically when I started my university career, that wasn't really a thing except for some niche circles, but that was really the, the when it all started in terms of AI and applying it to really important problems. So that's what I did at uh, Accenture. Now that's basically how my professional career progressed over the years, focusing first on scientific innovation, massive development, then really applying all these things hands-on in the drug design when then going more into strategic leadership was always really interested in building things not just individual tools software basically organizational teams visions that's basically what i naturally gravitated towards and then after uh, 10 years decided to leave Accenture and then join the company where i currently now energetics again focusing on AI driven drug design, something I, I really enjoy, of course. So that's basically my professional background. I'm based in Miami on the East Coast, as you can hear, obviously, uh, from, from Germany. You can probably tell on my accent. Very cool. Yeah, and, and that, that's uh, me in a nutshell. <laughs> that, that's a very fascinating nutshell, Adrian. And um, I'm very curious. You mentioned, uh, I think, three times the word, and I have a very loose idea of what it means, but would love to understand more. What is AI driven drug design? I think that the idea is, is uh, simple that, that with the promises, basically everything that AI, the machine learning, so always depends how you basically use one verb or, or one term or another, that you can at the simplest really leverage lots and lots of data it's basically in a machine learning algorithm that can really devour all your data process all the data find structure in it and with this kind of structure that extracts basic signal can this apply going forward basically to support decision making so that will be the, the first step that basically learn something from massive data that for any single human being wouldn't be basically feasible to basically go through all the data by hand and I thought this correlates with this if I have this and this is also to basically machine learning does it all for you and you can just apply this perspectively to the problems uh, that, that you want to solve so that's basically the idea in lots of domains and that's also true for uh, machine learning particularly because 
I mean, the drug discovery in drug discovery is quite expensive where you need to actually label things, do experiments that tend to be very expensive, very slow, and very with with AI. You can circumvent some of this, make this a lot faster. There's actually a huge benefit to all of that. There's also a lot, basically, a broad spectrum of how you apply AI to drug discovery. The first part is basically where you actually focus on in terms of disease areas, what kind of targets do you work on. That in itself is already a very challenging problem where you need to identify what target basically correlates or causes a disease of your interest. And then how do you actually validate that if target like like a protein is inhibited does it actually correlate to the outcome or the progression of a disease so you need something called biomarkers and make sure you have all of this that's already one big challenge for ai and drug discovery and then once you have this then is designing your what would you call modality so it can be a small molecule antibody whatever vehicle you use to modulate your protein target of interest it can also be uh, something else, but for simplicity, let's just focus on proteins. That's the next step, developing like a small molecule that you can just take as, as a pill. That is already, again, another huge challenge. And then the third part is basically demonstrating that all of this is safe and works in the clinic. So that's basically the third big piece, clinical development. And all of these areas, they have big promise uh, for AI, AI-driven methods. There are lots and lots of companies in all three different areas so you're trying to uh, amplify or make this more efficient and more successful the process because everyone knows it's very expensive it's very slow it's very uh, error prone is a high attrition rate so if with ai we can all of this make all of this faster cheaper more successful then overall you can basically shift the curve in, in a way and then make this overall cheaper and then more and more target salts or disease areas become more amenable to drug discovery that right now we only have a small cohort of patients that wouldn't be necessarily financially viable. So all the, the possible promises and applications of AI and, and drug discovery. So if I understood correctly, you broke it down into three main areas. You have, and I'm going to summarize in the way I understand, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So you have a basic area of mapping out the diseases or symptoms that you want to tackle that is an area in and of itself that's a hard that's a hard problem already right identifying what you want to try to tackle then you have a second component which would be let's say the engineering of the solution of how you want to tackle that disease or symptom and then you have the third component which would be the testing validation of that engineering hypothesis am i Correct, or am I so, so it, it's, it's roughly right. Maybe it's a, uh, it's a very abstract way, but still probably correct way of describing this. It's just again, first finding what you want to work on, what's basically your mm -hmm. disease of interest, what's then your protein or proteins of interest that are likely in, in, implicated in, in that disease, and then what do you need to actually modulate? Again, let's, let's say or proteins, what do you need to, for example, inhibit the, the, the action of a protein? It can be a small molecule, it can be an antibody, just to name two. And basically developing this kind of, as you call it, a solution that basically does what you want to do. It gets into the cell. In most cases, it gets into the cell, it gets to the protein, it basically stops the, the inhibits the protein, it stops it from working. How do you make sure it does nothing else? It's safe in, in, in the body. So maybe that's what you have to engineer at that step. And then the next big step is then demonstrating all of this in, in the clinic. So depending on the disease area, you have to find the right patients, especially oncology. It's a very difficult problem. Stratify, stratifying the right patient population with every cancer. It's basically uh, different. And then showing safety, showing that it actually works and ideally better than what's already on, on the market. Just three very big uh, areas. Very interesting. So if, if we fast forward down the into a, a future, distant or not, we could imagine a potential scenario where a, a model would be able to identify the diseases it would want to um, tackle. It would be able to also generate the engineering of the solution and also um, that it wouldn't be able to validate the solution, right? The, the solution would, would have to be validated in clinical trials with individuals regardless. But wh where are we right now with this tech and wh where were we? Like, how fast are we moving? Like, can you give a few examples as far as like what it used to take as far as time and the kinds of 
diseases that could be tackled versus what it takes now and the kinds of diseases that can be tackled with using uh, AI drug driven engineering? I think it's a bit ambivalent. I would say because on one hand, progress has been extremely fast, if not exponential, so not just in the area of machine learning, there's this kind of data driven approach where you feed a machine learning model lots and lots of data. There are also other computational approaches like molecular simulations. That's another big area that's largely independent of AI where you can just simulate uh, proteins and small molecules and their interaction on, uh, using basically GPUs and, and a lot of computational power. Again, there's a lot, a lot of uh, progress. I guess it's more the, the, the challenging part. So that's basically where the big, big breakthroughs will be. There will be the companies that basically are, are able to take to the, the capabilities that we have, the so machine learning algorithms, all these big uh, models and other methods and actually turn this into a process that works together, chemists, biologists, all the data we are generating. Because the drug discovery is not just, here's the data that's static, build a model and then be done with it. Because you have to use the model to actually help the data generation process in the first place, because one of the big challenges in drug discovery that in most cases, data is extremely uh, sparse it's, and it's really hard to generate lots of data especially for the later endpoints or essays where you have to get in vivo data let's you know, forget about data from from humans obviously that that's out of reach except when you're in the, in, in the clinic but that's very really time consuming and uh, expensive so those are the the, the major challenges that uh, all these companies focusing on AI driven drug design try to overcome. How do we make ML impactful as soon as possible while, while there isn't much data there yet? Because all something that needs to be considered in order to develop a drug, you by definition have to come up with something novel. So that's again, it's quite different from other domains. So even if you have lots and lots of data, it doesn't necessarily help you or basically, or basically how to transfer this kind of knowledge is very challenging. You have to come up with a completely novel compound, for example, in order to get a, a patent. So all the data you might have for a different protein or the, even the same protein, but similar chemical structures that you can't make uh, readily uh, uh, make, make use of because you, you have to stay away from the known data. So that, that's part of the problem. That's uh, so why that's often made. And additional methods come, uh, come in. They do some experimental screening to generate more and more data. It's also something that our company does basically focus on high throughput, very scalable data generation. You generate lots and lots of your own data in order to bridge that uh, gap. But you can also use other paradigms, again, like molecular simulations and uh, other things. But then probably the biggest challenge for everyone is that the human body, I guess it's it's not an uh, exact blueprint, blueprint for now. Basically it's also something that's constantly being uh, discovered. How does all the, the how do all the molecular mechanisms work? And even nowadays, still do the, discover completely new mechanisms like CRISPR and and and, and whatnot. You're basically, working with a black box, which makes it hard to predict how what you're developing will actually work or uh, respond. How patients will respond to the drug you're developing because it's such a complex system. So unless you have a perfect digital twin of a human body, you always have to basically focus on. This adaptive iterative learning, try something, get the data, learn from it, update your beliefs, your models, and iterate, 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 because you have to learn as, as you go along. And in your opinion, how far are we from having a fully digital twin from a biological perspective so that we could I, I think what I'm saying, so I'm not an expert in, in, in that area, but on local levels, when you have even organoids on, uh, uh, on cells where you can... On a local level, have uh, models for how cells behave or certain mechanisms in a cell. I mean, there's big uh, progress on the histology side of things where you can learn from, from imaging and things like this. But overall, we're talking about trillions of cells, how they interact. It's a very difficult temporal system. It's genes are expressed differently across your body at different times. So that's something you would have to learn fully understand. Uh, as well, there are lots of systems and your brain is a bit disconnected from the rest of your body. In what if you want to develop a drug that gets into your brain, that, that's a bit different. If you want to get something into yourself, it's a protein in the membrane. So there are lots and lots of exceptions. Also, 
maybe your area or your disease target is not protein, it's DNA, RNA. So that's lots and lots of uh, various ways to uh, it generate a drug or try to tackle a disease. Even recently now, uh, since COVID, everyone knows about messaging mRNA and how they can be used in various things, their cancer vaccines. So it's a very broad field of how you could possibly modulate this very complex system. But I don't think that we're that close yet to something that's a complete, you know, perfect. Yeah, it's interesting. When you this describe... Digital, digital yeah. Maybe I'm not sure if we even can at this stage completely model a single cell. So that would already be the first. I think maybe some organisms you can do it, but not on an organ level or the whole body. Please, I, I maybe it is, but I haven't heard of this yet. No, but it's, it's eye-opening to see the level of complexity of computational complexity that's involved in a in a human organism, right? It's uh, when you describe it at that level, it's hard enough to model a single cell, and then when you imagine all the trillions of interactions between all of these different uh, components, like you mentioned, all, all the gene expressions and how the cells interact with each other, and the exogenous components and all of that, it it becomes a, a, a very very daunting uh, computer modeling exercise and and you're i mean it seems Adrian, what you're doing to be to be a very positive thing for society i mean you're basically decreasing uh the barrier to cure basically you're making cure more widely available cheaper um developed faster and all of that within your field is there any kind of pushback with AI driven um, drug um, research or is it a unanimous thing that it's a good thing? Like how, how do people see it? So I would say it's generally uh, a good thing the way it's applied and, and, and used. I don't think there are any concerns in terms of existential risk or any, anything like this. It's more the opposite that people, especially uh, groups have, have done this for a very long time, like, like chemists, they actually want to see this work consistently the way they uh, they think about drug design and chemistry is so that if anything if it hasn't delivered yet to its full potential i think that's pretty clear and i would say that's probably where the consensus on right now given all the promises there's still a lot of human intervention possible to make it uh, work so i guess we are not even at that stage yet to make it see this as a, as a as a threat at all that's still a lot of work to be done to go from Here's a model, here's a product, turn this into a process that actually works consistently. And, the, and, and also the way a uh, medicinal chemist would work, what, what medicinal chemists can, can do. So not quite there yet. I mean, there are enough, I guess, examples where it really works. But if you really measure it but the way I think we should measure it by the number of drugs that come out at the end, and that's, that's the only metric that matters, is only the therapeutics that reach patients. There, I think it hasn't fully delivered yet to the potential. It, in my opinion, it it could, but it will take more time. So right now, it's just I'm, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been much pushback uh, yet. It might slightly be different on the clinical development, clinical trial side, because there it's more about patients, patient selections. So there it's a bit tricky generally when you just focus on uh, on, on data. Do you, are you making sure? You have to write patient subgroups. Are you busy that you have a balanced selection that doesn't? It's always there's always the danger with AI that you focus on particular features, but you're still making sure this covers all ethnicities and uh, and and questions like this. So that might be an area where there might be more pushback, busy where AI AI driven models they interact much more with patients, for example. In your opinion, Adrian. Um... You've been doing this for, you mentioned at least a decade, right? Where you first began working with AI uh, driven models. And so we're talking, you know, uh, a very, very early stage in AI um, development and deployment. Most people began being aware about AI given GPT 3.5, maybe ChatGPT. Um, and how has the deployment of these later models? changed or accelerated your research or or how much is it still the same are your models leveraging very similar things or are they very unique to um the specific domain and scope that you're working on it, it's still a combination of both but methods like uh, llm based or large language model based approaches i guess they open they would call, call a different dimension of how you actually use those models because they are what you call agentic 
you can basically have a model that works like an, an agent that you can string together. So then stop just focusing in a way on individual products, just basically predicting property A, B, C. You can start now thinking really in anger of how do you actually automate decision making? You have basically a model decide or based on this, I design this molecule, this is what I want to test and optimize for that. So that's now I think what people actively jumped on in, in the industry as well. Obviously through the all the chat GPT induced hype. I think it will be very interesting and generally this kind of interaction with agentic AI, not just in, in drug discovery, but here in particular, how do you make all these tools more accessible to end users? So instead of you having to work on 50 different tools, you can just tell an AI that basically is an, an agent, say, I want to achieve this behavior and basically create a plan of how you want to solve that problem and execute it. So there are actually examples where you have models or systems say, that work like this, they know some plugins or other means basically how to achieve a certain behavior. They can basically call or invoke tool A, they can query database B, and I think like this, and then they can basically string all these things together into end-to-end -end, uh, workflows. And in a way, it can abstract what used to be, or it's quite challenging in terms of how to use all these uh, methods. But the fundamentals are still, still there, just predictive modeling. How do you take all the data, detect some structure if they then use this to make new predictions generative ai again learning from all the data then basically shaping which, which i think what a generative model does shaping from point a to point b if it's a molecule if it's a protein structure if it's a ligand in a protein structure so that component is, is still there it's just now you have this extra layer on top where you can think about process automation end-to-end -end automation or even automating decision making so that's probably the highest level of ai it's like a self-driving car at some point if that's the promise you can just sit there and basically wait until it takes you where you want to be and that's i think where the future will be eventually i mean not right now i think that's what uh, the field is probably developing towards but you use the word hype what, what about it do you think is a hype is it public perception is it the tech itself do you think something about it is over promising something like what what is your take on i think it's, it's a combination of things and obviously it's, it's a thing with every technology if you want to start you have to hype and you have to sell it you have to get funding it's just part of how the how the game works it's everywhere the same where you have to maybe oversell in some instances that's what you see now that all the ideas that was started using either maybe not that useful after all, which again, for me, it's, it's not a bad thing, just how every cycle works. People try lots of different ideas. Many don't work, some work occasionally, but there will be a couple of real breakthroughs. I think that's the, the shape of every uh, revolution or new capability that, that comes uh, through. And as part of that, there was a lot of you know, discussion about existential risk on AI, that's which I guess for me, topic for, uh, a different uh, time, but this this also uh, came in. Otherwise, people, at least in this field, AI doing doctors' care, they have shown that there is uh, basically a promise of using all these models in, in doctors' care. We can achieve various kind of things with that uh, new technology. I think it's just the nature of any new disruptive technology that people get really excited. I'm very excited about their uses on a daily basis on my own laptop. And then it's always a different thing this is what it potentially can do this is what it actually does right now so in reality we're still further away from having a chat gpt system for drug discovery that actually leads to a drug so that that's definitely the, the hype phase might be in the future but in summary again it's not the first time this has been said on any new technology it's always overestimated in the short term underestimated in, in, in the long term it's the same here it's large language models slash foundational models and yeah, the doctor scary. I think over time, all of this will come together and really uh, need to make breakthroughs. And your, your industry, I mean, is very complex, right? You have the regulatory side, you're dealing with human lives, you have the chemists, you have the diseases, you, you have uh, medicine. I mean, it, it's the confluence of so many different fields and expertise, and there's so much process that's required from so many different angles and people to get something done that even if you can let's say 
really improve on the process, you're not going to completely disrupt the process of drug making. Like you said, maybe in some diff distant future, it'll be, you know, asking some model for prompt, you know, give me the disease and give me the cure and let me, let me give me the formula and test it out. But we're very far away um, from that. And so it, it seems to me that in, in your space, it's less about the disruption and more about being able to accelerate positive things. But in other spaces, we're already seeing a level of disruption that's very big. So for instance, in our space, in the translation and localization space, you have models that are very capable at um, translating very effectively, whether orally or in written form in, in many different languages. And then you start getting into a different kind of uh, problem, which is you get it very quickly into the area of human versus machine. That's how most people look at it. Is it is it at parity? Is it as accurate as a human? And uh, that already makes people feel very unsettled about um, the deployment of such models. And and I just wonder, in, in, in your opinion, in these like highly disruptive scenarios, do you think it's still a net positive outcome, or do you think it's something that needs to be approached with a lot of care? Like, how do you see this in in not necessarily just translation, but any any space that you can see that is being like more clearly disrupted by the technology? I think that that's a very good question. I think it forces us, or should force us, to actually think about the impact on society. You think overall, it's neither necessarily intrinsically good or bad is whatever we make of it the, the impact because on the positive side everyone is saying which is a bit of a uh, an interesting question and so everyone is saying ai will make lots of jobs redundant and nobody will need to work anymore and it's great and it's roll out universal basic income and every con everyone can live for the, for the better people say oh wait wait a minute it's not possible so i guess in some ways our thinking about society economy hasn't really caught up with the technology uh, technology i think that's that's the big problem in terms of technology we are all in the already in the far in the future when it comes to daily impact of technology on society and how we think most importantly about economy and people's place in economy there we're still I think probably in the middle of the 20th uh, century i think that's where we have to uh, catch up and maybe there will be a different system it could be if it's maybe it's a bit of a stretch economic system that can actually account for what's possible so ai when it is probably true many jobs will be redundant but again this should also mean that there will be a massive boost in productivity and if there's a massive boost in productivity maybe then it's fine if not everyone has to work for a living everyone gets a basic income and they can just focus on on other things but these discussions they already think being killed at the uh, beginning and generally many of us i guess they don't have this kind of uh, discussion also what does a certain job uh, for example mean like it's st st uh, stick to translation what's the job of a translator is it a bad thing if machines can translate 99 percent of documents and other things just finally then translators they can just focus on what i believe in my life. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not really familiar with the, the, the AI on where I think it's probably much more likely that AI cannot have any impact when you translate, as you cross that boundary, bound, boundary between translation and art. I think that's an area where that low artificial intelligence will penetrate anytime soon. Let me just focus on, on that instead. But again, having this kind of discussions about the nature of certain uh, jobs, it's also something that evolves constantly because they used to have very different jobs 100 years ago 200 years ago again com comes back to the same question just making sure that i guess our discussions our belief leaves they catch up with what's possible so technology i think that's i think it's held back in a way by political divisiveness and political beliefs they're not uh, getting you again or in a way getting closer to your personal identity which generally had to evolve or how to, how to move in, in, in a way. That makes sense. I do want to stretch this scenario a little bit further because from an economic perspective, like you mentioned 99%, let's say based on m my research, in most languages, translators are already changing less than 10% of the contents that they get from 
uh, either a neural machine translation engine or a large language model or combination of both, right? So they're, they're changing less than 10%. But we live in a space where translators were first paid by pages and by words, by some unit of measurement of the original text. But now we're moving into a, a place where, let's say, the vast majority, 90% of the text is already being unchanged, right? Mm -hmm. And then that leaves a problem for compensation because now if you're only doing 10% of the work, that may be a very important 10%, right? That may be like, like you mentioned, the difference between art and uh, process, like, like a chef who's able to taste the food and sprinkle just the right amount of salt or pepper to make it just perfect. It's the action may be small, the impact may be big in language that happens a lot. But when you get down to the economics of it, it becomes very challenging because ultimately doing less or either producing more, that would mean that the proportional output becomes less valuable, right? Because let's say if you, before it took you 10 hours to translate 3,000 words, and now you do those same 3,000 words in three hours, in theory, those 3,000 words should cost less, in theory, or at least there's an argument for that. And you have this tension between the people who are producing more in less time and the people who are paying for those things. And from a purely economic perspective, Adrian, in your opinion, is there like a path forward that provides, let's say, positive alternatives? Or do you think that any disruption in this case means people making less? Like, how, how do you see this correlation between um, productivity and, 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 and technology and the economics of, of all mm -hmm. of this? I think that the first thing I would say, that's probably true for other fields uh, as well, I wouldn't necessarily see that there's basically the, a finite sum of uh, amount of work that needs to be done. If it's software development, is it translation, it's more because it's much more scalable and cheaper, maybe then the, the whole pie actually dramatically increases. People actually want to translate what they didn't want to pay for before. I suspect in many cases it's like this, because before they probably didn't bother translating it at all, but now it's cheap, now they do it. I don't know, so maybe that's part of it. Uh, no, I agree, well. I, I agree now, 100%. I do think that the pie changes for sure. It's a dynamic so pie. Definitely, mm -hmm. that, that's definitely a part of it as well. It's also true for iOS, like, like software development now, because you have software that can generate basically software for you, then it will just give more people the idea, now I want to develop something as well, now it does this as uh, well. So overall, I think there will definitely be a shift in, in lots of jobs, but again, it all comes down to how if like a nation or society deals with that uh, change. So it's not the first time in, in history you look at like coal mining and, and, and things like this. There'll be, there'll be lots of jobs that will go away, but I guess the worst way is just basically ignoring these, these kind of facts and basically leave people to their own device. They are just basically figured out uh, yourself depending on, on the scale of the, the problem. But I think there's also there's new opportunities for uh, people that only... Uh, come to be because of AI generally data that's a massive uh, challenge for these kind of models need a massive a massive amount of, of data the more data the better that's why they're scraping the internet left and right every possible resource so in, in a way original content becomes far more uh, valuable like all that AI can do is basically even with all the input just interpolate between your input then there will be new opportunities which I think it's already happening that there's so much more content slash data generation. People write a lot more, see a lot more pictures and, and whatnot. So I think that's a possible opportunity just to adapt to the, the new AI driven economy in a way. And then probably for some, there will be just an uh, increased amount of specialty. That's, I think, again, true for every domain, including uh, my own of uh, drug discovery that people instead of just being replaced by AI, they're just basically the, all the water carrying, the easy tasks, they get automated, but then it still leaves like 10, 20% of tasks. They're really, really difficult where you have to think about the solution. Or maybe it's, there hasn't been a solution yet. So a machine can't really come up with the answer. So I'm, I'm sure it will be the same in a field like translation, where there are things that uh, can't easily be translated like art books so or any other thing that really requires a lot of expert knowledge and their people have to pay a lot more results. So I think one of the key 
considerations for using AI is that in many areas, most kind of expert driven areas, 90% is not enough, 95% accuracy is not enough, 99% is not enough. You need to have guaranteed 100%. Like in the medical field, you have to basically, that's why you always need a, a doctor because you need that amount of accuracy. Because even in a financial uh, calculation, one mistake can be disastrous. And same with some uh, documents, again, like in the di diplomacy, other fields, in one wrong word, can be a disaster. So there, I don't think at any time you will want to use um, uh, machine translation. So I think there are still areas where you can really uh, uh, specialize in a way to create your own domain and then in a way also generate more income because of your uh, specialization. Yeah, I, I, loved, I loved what you said, especially the part where you describe how the machine-like processes end up actually making the uniqueness of human content even more valuable because now, you know, like you said, any, any large language model can interpolate different sources of text and create a new text, but the kind of human creativity is still becomes even more clearly distinct than whatever the machine does. So in a way, the fact that it is more ubiquitous actually makes the humanity more scarce. So it's, it's a very interesting, um, economic dynamic that, yes. that you just have, have another uh, thoughts for you, especially in terms of translation, knowing your audience. I think that's an idea that I find quite interesting that in a way, I guess translation is never static. If you translate, if you look at the Bible or another book that depending on the time of translation and in a way, the content will change over time. That's why there will always be more and more to translate. There will be more and more reflection of its current times in a way that process is never finished. And there will always be, I guess, more and more subjective view, this individual creativity uh, uh, re required. So that's something I find quite interesting uh, as well, that as a translator, I guess you're part of a co-author, and in a way, especially in, in this field of highly specialized uh, doc documents. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you as far as like long-term vision. I, I see, just to summarize some of the points that you made, I see a, um, a much bigger pie coming that the fact that because of economic constraints, a lot, very little of the material that could be translated is actually translated, especially when you consider the entire range of languages that we have, um, you know, and how much of it gets translated, very little of it still gets translated because of economic constraints. So that's one thing. The other thing is what you mentioned, which I love, which is the nature of content itself is dynamic. The nature of translations is dynamic. And if it becomes um, less expensive, it's more possible to update it more frequently as well. So instead of revisiting the version of the Bible every 50 years, maybe you can revisit the version of the Bible on, on a weekly basis eventually. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, and then the other thing that you mentioned, which I really like is um, you kind of touched on is this idea of uh, versioning as well and um, specificity of text where maybe we, you and I read the same text, but it's going to read a little bit differently. It's going to be a little bit more personal for you than it is for me. And it, you start getting, you know, uh, the possibility of a lot more text and you do the, 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 the human virtues that are harder to emulate the creativity, the critical elements, the ability to make decisions around um, that last little mile, whether it's 0 0.01 or 1%, that really does matter, that becomes a lot more valuable. So I, and I, I agree and I see all of that. I think the challenge from, from in my opinion, Adrian, and I'd love your thoughts on this, is that for that all to happen, that's all beautiful. But at some point, if I'm your translator and right now I'm making, let's just say as an example, I'm making 20 cents per every word. And that metric was calculated based on the fact that maybe I could do a hundred thousand words in, 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 in a month. And now maybe I can do 300,000 words in a month. What's going to happen to my pay. And at some point, either you're going to tell me that you're going to pay me less, or I have to tell you that I'm going to make less in hopes of then making up for that by either getting more higher valued tasks with my time or m more activity with my lower time. And it seems like there's this, like chicken and the egg conundrum where it, nobody really wants to 
um, take that first step. I mean, and I, I get it. I mean, if I, if I did, if, if this were my livelihood, it would be hard for me to tell you, Hey Adrian, listen, you know, feel free to pay me half as much because I trust you that I'm going to get twice as much work and it'll make so it's, it's probably the client. They will definitely take the initiative say, look, I can go to this kind of website and they only pay this amount of money to translate my, my documents. They're probably already on the, on the rise of this, this kind of behavior that it's, not, not just in a tr- in translation of other areas. That's basically where people proactively see opportunity to save money. So it's probably more on the, the translator side, on the employee side that needs to uh, adapt, basically cope with this new reality that now what used to be uh, a larger market, now that becomes increasingly smaller for, cert- for certain tasks. So that's probably more the dynamic, right? It's there's already uh, this kind of behavior that the, the, the market is shrinking for, for many kinds of applications of areas of uh, translation. But now what do I, as you said, what do I do that now? I used to do this kind of uh, job for, for living. I earned that, uh, that amount of money, but now I get less and less jobs. And what I do now, so that, that's probably what you're asking, right? It's basically what's, uh, I guess, the individual's choice or possibility and what should we do as a society uh, about this, we have those two different areas. Could either be less affair, just let the market decide and see what happens, or come up with something more constructive for, for many areas, but it might probably depend also on the, the visibility or the relevance for society as, as, a, as, as a whole. So I'm not sure that that's probably how I would just describe it, but it's always best, I, I think, just to focus on the individual first and helps them to find to find a solution to this new changing uh, reality. I, I I really resonate with with those words, Adrian. Particularly, I love what you said earlier on, where you said it's neither good or bad; it is what we make of it. And I, and I think that that's a very good overall description of of our moment. And and I, I, I personally, I do believe in a lot of um, that the 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 bigger agency that we have as individuals the bigger the chance for constructive dialogue the bigger the chance for, bigger the odds for positive outcomes so i'm um i'm a big proponent of of these these words that you mentioned and um adrian if people want to get to know more about your work and um follow you how should people reach out to you how, how can people get to know more about your amazing ai driven drug research I think the easiest is probably just LinkedIn, my, my profile, so you can easily find me using my first name, last name, Adrian Schreier. So I'll probably find me then. Not many people with my name, so anyone wants <laughs> to connect, reach out, definitely welcome, welcome to do so. And I always enjoy this kind of discussions about different topics, just to explore different areas. I also find this very stimulating. Also, just to get out, because AI has such a broad impact, it's amazing how this goes in our domain, it's obviously very beneficial. It's not as disruptive on the employment market as to other fields. It's also important as to always see the impact uh, across other areas, other fields. How does this impact other other jobs? What helps helps I think everyone to think about: is this good? Is this is this bad? What's the actual impact? So something we we should consider as a society just to be exposed to more stories of broader impact of AI yeah, because it's it's basically the, another revolution like a computer like a mobile phone that's the next big thing even further going back all the way to the steam machine and everything that happens there that's why it's, it's not the first time in history this, this happens this kind of massive disruption again something to learn from I agree 100% Adrian and that's also why uh, I'm a big fan of these conversations. I'm very grateful for everything that you shared with us today. I'm definitely cheering on for your research because I know that it's going to help the lives of millions of people and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you so much for all of your thoughts. Thank you everybody for being here with us today at uh, Merging Minds and we'll be back soon. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Everybody, bye-bye. Thank you.